Um, thank you everybody for joining another Tiny ML talk. Um, today we have a great talk by my colleague, Sean Hemel, and I'm Jenny Plunkett, and we're both from Edge Impulse. And today, Sean is going to present to us on constrained object detection on microcontrollers with FOMO. <clears throat> the Tiny ML Talks um, strategic partners would like to thank, um, we'd like to thank Aeon Devices, ARM, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, PhotoHub, Greenwaves Technologies, Gravity Inc., HOTG, ImageMob, Itemis, Clica Tech, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Analog Devices, Micro.ai, NXP, Prophecy, Qualcomm, Kixo, Reality AI, Grenasos, Reeksin, SAP, Seed Studios, SenseML, Sony, ST, Stream Analyze, Sensense, and Sentient. Thank you all for joining our in-person event this year, the Tiny ML Summit um, this year. Uh, there was a great turnout and you can view all of the videos and recordings from that um, summit on the tinyml.org website at the link or at the QR shown here. Um, the next event um, should be sometime this year. Um, so check out the tinyml.org slash event page for that. The next Tiny ML Trailblazer series will be on April 6th at 8 a.m. PST with the founder of Seed Studios, um, Eric Pan and the Chahu Makerspace. I apologies for butchering that, um, but register now at the QR code listed there. Also, please join our growing tiny ML communities on meetup.com and LinkedIn. The groups are listed there. We have over 8.8 thousand members in meetup and 2.7 thousand members in the LinkedIn community. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's over 6.4K subscribers in 347 videos. Um, all of these talks that you're witnessing right now are recorded and uploaded to this YouTube page. Um, so if you miss any, please go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. The next Tiny ML talk is today, right after this one, um, by Tan Daniel Konigan and Marcus Rube, um, talking about Autoflow, an open source framework to automatically implement neural networks on embedded devices. So stay tuned for that immediately after this talk. So I'd like to introduce Sean Hemel. Sean is a machine learning DevRel engineer, instructor, and university program manager at Edge Impulse. He creates compelling technical videos, courses, and blog posts around edge machine learning and embedded systems that inspire and teach engineers of all skill levels. Sean is an advocate for enriching education through STEM and believes that the best marketing comes from teaching. He can be found giving talks, running workshops, and swing dancing in his free time. So I'd like to introduce Sean on constrained object detection on microcontrollers with FOMO. Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. And as Jenny mentioned, we're talking about constrained object detection, which is a little different than object detection if you're familiar with working in computer vision. And I'm going to talk about that. And I'm not going to reveal what FOMO means in this particular case quite yet until we get towards the end. So this is what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to give a brief introduction to Edge Impulse. Many of you are probably familiar with it if, you're, if you've been attending these talks for a while. I'm going to talk about object detection and image segmentation. Understanding a little bit of the background is necessary to understand constrained object detection because constrained object detection uses pieces from both of those, but it's not quite either one. And then I will talk about many of the use cases, how to get FOMO to work the best possible way you can and some of the limitations with it. Finally, I'll give you a brief demo, time permitting, using the OpenMV cam and you get to see face detection running in real time. So Edge Impulse is an online studio that helps you collect data, analyze your data, train machine learning models, including any of your signal processing code to extract features, once you have that model, you can test it using a variety of tools and then finally deploy it to nearly any device. And when I say nearly any device, I really mean nearly any device. As long as you have a C++ compiler, you can take our code for performing inference. It's open source when you download it. You can look through it and see 
the model code, you can see all of the wrapper libraries, the DSP code, and port that to your own system. However, we support a number of systems development boards to make this whole process easier so that you can get up and running as fast as possible. This also includes our award-winning Eon compiler that takes your TensorFlow like for microcontrollers code, that interpreted code model, and put it to C++ code. It runs a little bit faster and takes up a little less space on your microcontrollers, which we all know uh, you're very constrained when it comes to resources when working on those low power devices. Let's give a brief overview of object detection and image segmentation if you're not familiar with it. You are probably familiar with the idea of image classification, and that's where I give an image to a model, and the model tries to determine what that image is composed of. For, say, for example, I want to determine if this is an image of a cat, or this is an image of a dog, or a park, whatever it might be, that's image classification, where it classifies the entire image. However, what happens when you have an image of a cat and a dog? In this case, the model is going to have to choose among whatever classes you've given it. So it's going to say, oh, it's a cat, even though it also has a dog, or it's a dog, even though there's also a cat in it. Object detection comes into play when we want to identify multiple objects. They could be anywhere in the image. We want to know what size they are and where they occur. In this case, many times object detection gives us bounding boxes around those regions and gives us a classification for those objects that have been detected. The bounding box gives us the extents of the object as best as it possibly can and shows us kind of how big it is in the image, where it is. It's usually given by an X and Y coordinate that's either the center of the image or the top left corner of that bounding box, as well as a width and height in number of pixels. Along with that bounding box, we get a classification. And the classification is usually a series of predictions out of the softmax function. In this case, the highest prediction was cat for this cat object at say 98% and dog at 83%. So we can safely assume that that bounding box shows us where a cat and where a dog is. The naive approach to doing this is to use a sliding window and perform sub image classification using a basic image classification model. In this case, we just take a window, say starting at that top left, we send it to our model and say, is this dog or is this background? And it'll say, oh, that's a background. And we continue sliding that window over by some stride amount classifying every sub image in this larger image. And we end up with something like this, where we have all of the white boxes are the sub images that classified as dog. And you can see I have a misclassification here, but my dog was successfully classified in the middle of the image. You might end up with multiple boxes and there are ways to combine those to create a singular bounding box. And so we can say, okay, the dog was found here, but maybe there's a false positive on the left side of the screen here. This gives you an idea of the naive approach for doing this. So models grew out of this. And one of the first breakthrough models we got was the region-based convolutional neural network or RCNN. Here it takes an input image and I've got a picture of my dog here with, uh, I think this is like 240 by 240. It goes through a region proposal model, which then identifies various regions that could be an object of interest. Each of these regions are then sent to a convolutional neural network that then goes to, in, that convolutional neural network extracts features. That's what that CNN is doing in order to figure out, oh, hey, what's in this piece of this image? It goes to some sort of classifier. Traditionally, our CNN use a support vector machine, but you can use any classifier. It could be a dense neural network once you have those features or even more CNN. From there, you get a number of class predictions. This could be the background, the ball, the tug toy, or my dog itself. Along with the class predictions, you get those regions that go into another model, in this case, a regression model. And that output of that regression model is our bounding box information. You get an X, a Y, width, and height for each of those regions that you saw. And that's how you end up with those bounding boxes. You can draw those, you can overlay those on the image to see, oh, that's the dog, that's the tug toy, or that's the ball. Unfortunately, this model, unfortunately, this model requires you to perform CNN or feature extraction and classification on every single region. It requires multiple iterations. Many models resulted from this, 
we have a whole slew of object detection models, but I'm going to skip to the interesting ones where we start talking about single shot detectors. This is things like your S mobile net SSD or your YOLOs um, V1 through V5, I think we are on now. And the idea here is that rather than performing classification on the regions of interest multiple times, or excuse me, multiple classifications on all of your regions, we end up doing one pass through the entire network where it figures out different bounding boxes, classifies those, and gives us a set of classifications and bounding boxes on that image. And it does this in a single pass. And you can see this where it starts with a classification network in order to extract features. In this case, it might be something like VGG19 or MobileNet V1 or V2. That gives us those features, those latent representations of what's in that image that's sent through a series of convolutional layers which go to classification heads and then you can perform something like non-maximum suppression in order to get a singular bounding box from the multiple bounding boxes that were, uh, were started off at as assumptions in the image so keep that in mind as we're going to talk about how we're performing fomo using object detection but i want to briefly mention image segmentation because what FOMO does is actually a combination between object detection and image segmentation. Image segmentation is where we want to classify each individual pixels inside that image. So this is a very contrived example where we have a laptop, a glass on a table, and we want to identify the shape and where those objects are. Although we're not really identifying the object, we're just saying, oh, these pixels belong to this particular class. And you can see that the laptop was shaded black, the background, the wall was white, the table was yellow, the glass is blue, and I think the cord ends up being red. It's, it's This is a contrived example. I don't think there was an actual model that did this, but this shows you we're separating the pixels into different classifications in order to determine the shape of the objects. And this is very useful in things like medical imaging or medical image analysis, where we look for things like cancerous cells, and the shape of the cell is what determines its class. So this is really interesting in those use cases um, in addition to doing things like object detection. As a result of this, this is where we get into constrained object detection. And we're using constrained because it's not quite object detection, it's not quite image segmentation, but it's some combination of the two. This is a trick or this is a neat methodology that Edge Impulse, the Edge Impulse engineers came up with. And it involves taking MobileNet V2 um, in this case, it's been pre-trained on ImageNet and MobileNet V2, we have a series of bottleneck layers after that first convolutional layer that take your image, in this case, I'm going to assume a 240 by 240 image, and creates a series of representations. These are going to be smaller, so instead of 240 by 240, it might be two pixels by two pixels, or sometimes you end up with one pixel and it's just a bunch of these representations. These go into a classification area where you have convolutional layers or sorry, fully connected layers going into softmax to perform that classification in order to get that out. What we do is we actually slice between those bottleneck layers, res, uh, the ResNet, or excuse me, the residual block three and four, and we tack on our own per cell classification. And when I say per cell, remember that those feature maps, those what were latent representations going through that network look something like this. And we end up with 16 feature maps and each cell contains a, contain, like looks at a particular piece of that input image, your receptive field. And it's coming down and creating those representations. And then we classify each of those cells on those feature maps. That works much like image segmentation. And from that, we can determine where the objects of interest are generally within the picture on this grid. For this to work, we take the image, essentially divide it by eight width and height. So we start with 240 by 240. The division by eight is uh, a default. It's a hyperparameter that can be eventually tuned, but right now it's set in edge impulse. And so we end up with 30 by 30 cells, this feature map that we can overlay on top of the image and get an idea of where those interesting bits are and classify those interesting bits in order to figure out, oh, hey, we think there's an object here. There's a dog, there's a ball, there's a tug toy, what have you. 
note that I mentioned earlier that the weights in the residual blocks are pre-trained from ImageNet. So when you're doing this, you're just doing transfer learning, which saves you a lot of time. The per cell classification, it is done with fully connected layers, but we use 2D convolution with a one by one kernel. It ends up working a little faster, but it's essentially the same math in order to perform fully connected layers to classify each of those pixels. Those then go through each pixel, or excuse me, each cell, you can think of them like a pixel if you were to view this as an image, though the classifications go through the softmax layer to get your different classes per cell. So what does this look like? We've got the receptive field in the image itself, and that essentially gets compressed down to one cell in that representation or that feature map or a heat map, if you want to call it that. And that slides over and continues the same thing. Each cell is then given scores. This could be the probability of your background, the ball, the dog, the toy. And you can pick, oh, that area contains background. That area contains dog and so on. And this is where we get to the name of FOMO, which is faster objects, more objects. I suppose it's like a play on YOLO in the sense of the two O's being there. But faster objects, more objects means that we can detect more objects, and we can do it very quickly on microcontrollers. Here's another example of what this might look like. So here is a picture of a lamp and a mug. We're trying to find those objects, and we get the bounding boxes that look something like this, and you can see the heat map and what that might look like with the two different classes showing up here in red and green, and we can determine that those cells contain those objects. So I've overlaid that grid, that feature map, as a grid on top of an original image here. Note that right now, FOMO only works with grayscale, but expect RGB in the future. This is a low resolution image of some screws on a table. It's 96 by 96 pixels. The feature map ends up being a 12 by 12 grid that we've overlaid on top of this. And when we perform inference, it looks at that original image the model picks out which of those grid spots it thinks contains screws. In this case, it's just classifying those areas. And everything that I've not drawn in red here is considered background, right? The probability of background is higher and the probability of screw is higher for these areas that I've marked here. You end up with something like this where you have multiple hits next to each other. So how do you know if it's one screw versus two screws or whatever you might have that you're trying to identify? What we end up doing is any neighboring cells that contain a hit for a similar object or the same object, those get squashed into one. And we don't interpolate between the grid spaces. It just picks whatever the highest probability for that class, that grid space, and removes any of the other neighboring grid spaces of the same class that had some probability over a threshold like 0.5 or 0.6. So as you can likely see, that means we ignore some of the parts of oblong objects, and that's a potential limitation. In addition, objects that are close together, they might get confused and squashed into one. So keep that in mind if you're going to be using FOMO. How the user inputs ground truth labels they do this by drawing bounding boxes much in the same way you would for training YOLO or MobileNet SSD. This is what we have in the Edge Impulse tool at the moment because it supports doing both original object detection and constrained object detection. So the tool then takes this bounding box information, finds the centroids of those bounding boxes, and then picks the grid that that centroid lands on. So in this case, these cells of that 12 by 12 grid are considered to have screw. That is the screw label. Everything else is background. And once again, you can see that we're kind of ignoring oblong objects here in the sense of the tips of the screws or the heads of the screws might not be part of the ground truth, which makes training a little tougher, even though those should be considered screws. That's something to keep in mind when we go to deploy FOMO. Um, you really want your objects to take up about one grid because it makes training a lot more accurate. So we got a couple of questions here. Can available DSP capable microcontrollers and microprocessors have advantages calculating multiple convolution layers necessary for MobileNet V2 or YOLO? I've seen some. I believe that the OpenMV, what is that? The ARM Cortex M7, 
uh, that has some DSP that does have some advantages for calculating those. What I have found is that's about the that's about the lowest microcontroller you can use in order to run something like MobileNet v2 or YOLO. Um, the only way I could get MobileNet v2 even maybe sort of running was on the OpenMV Plus, and that's just because it has a lot of RAM. Uh, from my experience, I don't remember what the requirements are for YOLO, but MobileNet v2 needs like a few megabytes of RAM and just many microcontrollers um, don't have it. So kind of your ARM Cortex M7 is about the minimum or the, the, the minimum starting point, which is where this gets interesting because I've seen FOMO running at like two frames a second on an ARM Cortex M4. And it required about 250. I've seen it down to even like 100 kilobytes. So you can run FOMO on very low power, relatively low power microcontrollers. How to find good dimensions of the feature maps? Should it be 12 by 12 or more? Obviously, the more you the 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 more grid spaces you have, the more precise your location of your objects are going to be. So because because you have more grids where they could be, so you end up with better precision, but that means you need a larger input resolution, which then means you need more RAM and you need more processing power. So that's your trade-off, right? Do you want it to run very fast and you don't need a lot of precision? You can have smaller, like 96 by 96 input images mean you end up with a 12 by 12 grid or something like a 240 by 240 because you need better precision or smaller objects you're looking for. You're gonna end up with a 30 by 30 grid and you end up with better precision of where that might be. And then another one, are there already pre-trained FOMO for some generic tasks like people, animals, cars, and so forth. Yes, Edge Impulse has a number of those. If you head to the blog where they announced FOMO, I believe they give one for face detection. There's one for, we were working on one for cars. Um, and Jenny could probably answer that one. Where, where's the one for cars that we were working on? So there. I'll find it. Okay, I'm okay. I, I know we... <laughs> We, we were working on one and I, I don't quite remember what happened to that, but there's one for cars. There's one for uh, face detection. Face detection actually works surprisingly well. Um, and there were ones that I don't think it's live yet, but we're working on one for identifying parts like screws, washers, nuts. Um, I'd love to do one for electronic components, but I was struggling with it because the components are very similarly shaped, especially like diodes and resistors. Um, and it struggled a bit with that. So I need to play with that one more, but, um, and I know Jenny, you had one that was like a conveyor belt that was looking for like boxes and orientations, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty old one that we, that's before even FOMO even existed. Um, but all of the projects that Sean and I are mentioning, um, we will find the links and we'll post those on the event page for this talk, um, after. Yep. Thank you. So here's one use case. I highly recommend checking out Matt Kelsey's blog post here where he tries to count bees and he does so using FOMO. In this case, the bees are kind of squarish, not really square, but each one takes up about one of those grid spaces. So it becomes a fairly easy task to count them. You can see a couple of instances here where the bees were missed, but that's okay because he was just trying to get a general idea of how many bees were in the hive that he was keeping because he wanted to know what the activity was. Did it rise and fall with the seasons? Was it growing over time? This was an interesting use case for counting similar shaped objects that are a particular distance from your camera. And in order to determine the health of something, in this case, a beehive. So FOMO is really good to know where and how many objects there are. And it's really good when you can keep the distance between your camera and your subject or subjects static. The one of the ones that Jenny and I were talking about was this idea of counting cars. And there are pictures of cars driving on a highway, right? Imagine a camera mounted on an overpass. We're looking for cars that are driving towards or away from us. And that one ended up being a little tough because some of the cars were closer to the camera where you, you know, the cell might be a headlight as opposed to cars that were farther away where the cell contained most of the car or car in a lot of background. So you end up with different classifications for both, which isn't great. It's really struggled. I find that it would be better if you can mount, say, a camera that's um, away the same distance from a highway that's, say, going perpendicular from your shot 
and all the cars are about the same size. That's going to work a little better. And ideally, you want to get your objects to be about the same shape, shape and size as a grid. So round, circular or squarish objects work better than, say, oblong ones like we were looking at those screws. Even though it could find the screws fairly easily on that background, it sometimes struggles because like the tips and the heads of the screws end up either being misclassified or just ignored completely. So, and you want the, when you're determining the distance from your camera, do some calculations if you can to figure out where an object might be that is, a, that makes it so it takes up about a cell. That's gonna be your best bet rather than taking up multiple cells. As you saw earlier that um, whenever you're doing the classification of those individual cells, things kind of get squished together and you might miss some things. This is pretty fast, as I mentioned earlier. I saw this running on a Cortex M4. I believe that was on the Sony Spresence, and it was pulling two frames a second. That's an M4. Um, the model was like 100 kilobytes, which is impressive. On the Cortex M7, which I'm going to show you on the Open MV camera, it runs. Uh, that's that processor is running at 480 megahertz. We're taking a 240 by 240 image input, and it's running at 30 frames a second, only taking up about 250 kilobytes of RAM. A uh, couple questions. Aside from an RGB implementation, what does the future hold for FOMO? Even smaller models, sensor fusion capability? Quite possibly. Um, and that's a good point I forgot to mention right now. FOMO is only grayscale. RGB is possible, and I have to imagine that is coming. Um, but at the moment, it's only grayscale. Um, smaller models, probably a lot of it's determined by kind of your, yeah, the model size itself uh, is, is set. I think there's an alpha parameter that you can adjust that determines the uh, number of nodes or filters you might have, which gives you the different feature, the number of feature maps out. You can adjust that, but um, that divided by eight I talked about, uh, that's a hyperparameter, which means in the future, hopefully we can tune that. Um, so you can divide by eight more or less, depending if you want more or less accuracy or more or less speed. Sensor fusion capability, um, not sure for a CNN, uh, the way those work, they usually work better on image image types of data, which can include things like spectrograms um, or radar output. So possibly, but I don't know sensor. I don't know if it works super well. Something like sensor fusion. Um, that's a good question, though. I, I'll have to I'll have to look into that. I I usually see things like convolutional neural networks working better for image type data. Uh, I would like to objectively assess the accuracy of FOMO. Typically, we use IOU-based metrics, such as MAP, which look at the overlap. Since FOMO calculates centroid, what metric do we use to assess its accuracy? And this is something, I don't have a good answer for this. And this, this was something um, I was, I was uh, chatting with our ML engineers about, simply because it's hard to compare um, accuracy metrics to other object detection methods, such as MAP, um, IOU and MAP, that it's, it's it, you, you can't really get that because there's no bounding box information you get out of FOMO. Um, the best you can probably do is get accuracy metrics based on um, your ground truth on a test set versus the identification of the particular cells. Um, I wish we could do a apples to apples comparison with other object detection uh, models, but it's actually really hard as you can see. But yes, uh, IOU and, and MAP, um, are the traditional ways to measure object detection and, and FOMO just doesn't quite play nicely with those metrics. So um, I don't know, it's something our ML engineers were chatting about and trying to find a good way to give accuracy metrics out of this. So I hope that helps. I wish I had a better answer for that one. So what are some of the limitations here? As I mentioned, uh, hopefully you have the idea now that each cell of that representation that comes out of your convolutional layers, your, your bottleneck layers, each one of those has its own classifier. As a result of that, some smaller objects may get completely missed, especially if they weren't in that ground truth or training data. And some of your neighboring objects might get squished together to become one identified object. As you can see in this car example we have, this is an actual output from FOMO. You can see that the three cars in the middle there kind of got classified as two cars. It just took two of them and squished together, or there were two cars that we're on the, on the boundaries between those cells. This is where things get a little difficult and why it's very important um, to try to ensure that your objects are about the same shape and size as your cells. And at the moment, because we squish those, those identified cells together to create one, 
it's, it's pretty important that you don't have objects really bunched up together, or if you need better precision, make your input resolution higher, which gives you more cells and more possibility to have cells in between when you're identifying individual objects. Um, also, oblong objects might get, or excuse me, ends of oblong objects might get ignored because we're doing the centroid of those bounding boxes. Really only that center cell is the thing that gets identified. The other parts are just ignored at, for the moment, um, which is why it's also important to try to avoid using oblong objects where you can, unless you can fit it entirely within one of those cells. If you need oblong objects, if you need uh, bounding box information, if you want to work with lots of objects and classes, you're probably better off using one of the larger object detection models like MobileNet SSD or YOLO V5. Now I'm going to go show you a brief demo. So I'm going to Alt Tab out to, nope, I need to end this. And I'm going to go to Model Testing. And this is the edge impulse project that we have set up for doing face detection. And we have got a bunch of images here in our data set of various faces. And you can see they probably take up somewhere between like one and four cells. And they're fairly square-ish, which helps. So you're going to get some unique features like eye or nose that's going to be in the center of that uh, cell. We have our impulse design here. There's not much that's pre-processing that's going on. Uh, the images are cut to 96 by 96 to make them square. So we end up with a you know, 96 by 96 input image, which means we get that 12 by 12 grid to determine where each of the objects or a face in this case might be. Object detection in Edge Impulse looks something like this. You can choose different models. So you can actually use MobileNet SSD. Um, there's no YOLO here, but we have FOMO with alpha scores 0.1 and 0.35 to give you a little better uh, accuracy or a little worse accuracy. Um, if you go with worse accuracy, it's going to run a little faster. Um, th these models end up being like less than 100 kilobytes in size, which is impressive for some of these resource constrained devices. And then we go to model testing. You can see the result of some of these. So I can bring this up, show classification. And, oh, it's classifying at the moment. Uh, could there be any way to take advantage of motion detection to help decide which cells of, for the example of counting bees, they're most likely moving? That's a very good question. Right now it's per frame. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. I don't know. You'd have to look at something that's across time in order to make that happen. Maybe multiple frames goes into some type of classifier um, to help that out. Um, but that's a good point. I will take that back to the ML engineers and it's something we can ponder. If there was hair detection, what would the limitations be? Uh, I guess I guess the question is, what do you mean by hair detection? Are you looking at like a single strand of hair? Are you looking at like my entire hair here? If my entire hair was here, you got to think about where that bounding box might be. And you're going to have the centroid be something like this. So as long as it's, you know, it's, it's kind of squarish and it, and it might work if you're looking for that. Entire hair. Okay. So entire hair. Yeah. Think about the bounding box. Um, so there's some assumptions that like there's going to be a forehead. There's, there, you know, it, there might be some background here, um, but it, it should work. You should just be able to take a bunch of pictures of faces, do bounding boxes and, and make that happen. Um, here's an example of somebody giving a speech and we've got the face detected, detected right in the middle here. So if you go to deployment, and I'm not going to show you deployment because I have it ready to go and this takes a little bit. You can do the C++ library if you want to run it on just about anything, Raspberry Pis, microcontrollers, as long as you've got a C++ compiler and enough RAM to do it, uh, you can make it work. But we also support Arduino, we support uh, WebAssembly for if you want to put it on, say, like your cell phone or, or a browser, um, the NVIDIA Jetson series, um, and the OpenMV, which is MicroPython based, and I'm going to show that. Would using an end-to-end -end reinforcement based tracker detection to solve some limitations while we'll see. Um, here's the problem with RL at the moment. TensorFlow Light Micro does not support RL. Um, RL is some re reinforcement learning is something that I'm actually learning. And what I'm running into is it doesn't really work on microcontrollers just because TensorFlow doesn't support it at the moment. Once those, once those operations and layers become available, I have to imagine that we're going to start seeing some of that on microcontrollers. Um, and then we can use that for things like uh, 
tracking and 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 determining where the objects might be, say, in the next frame, and and predicting that. Um, yeah, that, I mean, uh, recurring neural networks can also possibly help solve that as well. But once again, RNNs aren't really supported in TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. They might be supported in TensorFlow Lite for things like single board computers. Um, I don't know the answer to that one, um, but I know at the moment they're not supported by, it's not supported by TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Uh, OpenMV has frame difference in capabilities for its supporting hardware that can show movement differences between frames in case a person wasn't aware would be difficult for lots of objects like these. Uh, that's a good point. You can do differencing. If your camera is static, you can do uh, frame minus frame and you get where the differences are. And so learning where those differences might be is, is a good way to just ignore the background completely and just figure out where things are and, and tracking that. That's a great way to do that. Thanks, Justin. Uh, for the highway car counting problem, could you do some pre-processing to scale known areas of the image to match the base? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you if you're working with a static image, um, and you know that like you've got perspective going into the distance and things are going to be smaller, you could take regions and blow them up in order to watch them in order to make your objects about the same size. You could definitely do some of that. I mean, it's it's like a simpler version of those car cameras, which give you a perspective around the whole car. It's just like skewing parts of the image mathematically to make the objects about the same size. That's a really great idea and possibly a way to solve it if you're trying to mount this camera and doing car detection on a highway that's away from you or towards you. So let's take a look at our open MV. We've got the inference code here. It's taking a 240 by 240 window, um, but that FOMO model should be chopping it to 96 by 96. It, oh, it might not actually, I just realized because it, once you train it, the model, it doesn't really care what the input is because it's doing those bottleneck layers. And as long as you're above some sort of minimum, the model doesn't care, the model just works. Do note that I'm showing RGB right now so that you can see RGB in the window, um, but it does require grayscale for FOMO to work. So I'm going to fire this up. You can see me here once it comes around and identifies probably my nose, eyes, nose, mouth, something kind of in this region that's going to be a cell. But if I cover my nose or cover an eye, yeah, it, it struggles pretty hard. So it needs to see that. Let's see, mouth. Yeah, so it doesn't care about the mouth. The nose is, seems to be what it really cares about. And then maybe some combination with the eyes. So that's, that's the areas it's looking for. And you can see a couple of false hits here and there. And the reason that green circle is jumping around is because remember, you're trying to identify where the object is on a grid. It kind of snaps to those, or it does snap to those grid points. It's not doing any sort of interpolation between them. And I can move the camera around and you can see it tracking my face and it'll work for multiple faces. I just don't quite have an example of that right now. Um, I did test it at a local conference recently and it tracked multiple faces, no problem. And let's get back to my slideshow here. I have one last point to make and then we will open it up for questions. So if you'd like to get started using FOMO, as I mentioned, I've seen it working on the Sony Spresence. Uh, you just saw it working on the OpenMV. Um, it should work on the Arduino Portenta. Um, I've heard it works on the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense if you keep the image size super small. Um, it's going to be really slow, but that that might actually work because that's an ARM Cortex M4 as well. You're really limited on memory in that and it like barely fits. But please head to docs.edgeimpulse.com in order to learn more about FOMO, how it works, getting started with it if you want to play with it. Uh, we have tutorials in there. If you go to count, if you go to tutorial section, counting objects using FOMO, uh, you get some more images, demonstrations, examples, and a walkthrough of how to get started. And as I mentioned, we do support a number of dev boards. So Thank you for your time watching this, learning a little bit about FOMO and seeing the live demonstrations. I will open it up to questions. So we've got one, uh, can it recognize, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the questions right now. Har 
highway car counting problem. Yes, we chatted about that. Can it recognize faces with their names, with their data set of two to four people? That is not a lot of data. Um, individually identifying faces is going to be extremely difficult because you need lots of data for one particular person for a model to learn, oh, this is that person versus other people. Um, and right now, as I, as I showed, FOMO was kind of looking at this region, right? It's looking for a nose and two eyes in order to determine that is a face. And that is not a, a lot of identifying information about me to uniquely identify me. So FOMO, I'm going to I'm going to say that FOMO is probably not the best model to use for individually identifying people. It's really good, as you saw, at picking up face, just face in general, because it's kind of looking at this area. I could cover my mouth and it just didn't care. Uh, works for the NanoSense with, oh, thank you, Marcelo. Yes, yes, I've heard rumors that it works on the Nano 33 BLE Sense, but really small input. Uh, I'm curious, Marcelo, what was your frame rate? Because um, I'm assuming it's grayscale, 48 by 48 pixels. Um, what was your frame rate? Was it like two-ish frames a second, one frame a second? Two, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was seeing for those uh, Cortex M4s. But, you know, what was this, five years ago, I was seeing the Raspberry Pi 3B doing things like YOLO or... or um, Oh, mobile net, mobile net V1 ish SSD. And that was like two frames a second. So now that we've taken a, a simpler version of object detection that we were running on a Pi at two frames a second, and now we're running on a Cortex M4 at the same frame rate, it to me is mind blowing. Another point here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mark. Yeah. FOMO, FOMO is pretty slick. Um, limited use cases. So you, you really have to make sure that you're kind of playing within those rules um, in order to make FOMO work the best. Because um, I've seen data sets where it just kind of fails on and you're going to be better off with like YOLO or, um, or mobile net SSD. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really slick. And the fact that we can run on a Cortex M4 is, is mind blowing to me. Yes, Justin, uh, the AI kit, I'm assuming that's the one from Arduino, the Nano 33 BLE Sense. Um, yeah, it'll, it should work on that because that comes with the camera. It's something I, it's on my list of things to do is to put together, I've got that kit and I want to get the camera up and running on it and then be able to do FOMO with it. All right. I think we've got about any other last questions. Uh, what all devices it worked the best? Um, kind of the ones I've listed, we know it works, the, especially the supported devices for edge impulse, like your open MV your Portenta, uh, the, the Sony Express Sense, uh, the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense, those all work. Uh, but in theory, it should you can take that C++ library and as long as you have that compiler, it should work on anything. Uh, yeah, it should run on an ESP32. Um, haven't tried it yet. I've actually been working on a tool where I can visualize the output of the ESP32 cam. Um, cause I want to take that and be able to see what I'm looking at. Um, there is, there are some examples out there where you take the ESP32, uh, it, it hosts a web page, streams the camera to that. So you can connect to the web page and you can watch the output of the camera there. Um, I'm trying to do it through USB so I can do it with any number of devices. Um, so I can watch that, but yeah, the ESP32 camera is something I'm hoping to do. In fact, I, I need to do that for an upcoming workshop, I think in like May or June, it's on my list of things to do. Um, put it on the SP32. Sweet, thank you, Rick, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Can it be used for PoseNet or something similar? Ooh, I'm assuming that's the Google, um, I'm, I'm assuming that's the Google model where you, you take uh, images of people and it determines your joints and it figures out your pose and kind of gives that as information. Um, I don't know, that's a very good question. Um, Potentially, I don't know what's in PoseNet. So somebody who knows Pose who knows PoseNet better than I do can probably answer that. Because um, right now, all you're going to do is determine like person, 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 and you you have to do some additional computation to figure out where those joints are. But I, PoseNet is something I've been meaning to play with. Um, I want to take PoseNet 
this is what I'm going to, this is what I'm planning to do for um, a different conference is take PoseNet and feed it into a classifier inside Edge Impulse and use that to determine different poses. Uh, does it support risk? Risk 532 MCU, uh, so long as you have a C++ compiler for it, yeah. Um, it helps if you've got uh, vector extensions for things like DSP neural networks. So like your CM sys, your ARM CM sys NNs, it makes things run a little faster because it's got actual hardware accelerators in them um, to do some of these calculations. Um, but as long as you've got you know enough RAM, enough flash memory, and you've got a C++ compiler, yeah, it'll run. All right, uh, thank you all. I'm gonna give it back to Jenny for now. Great, thank you so much, Sean. That was a great presentation. And thank you everyone for asking a bunch of questions. Um, you should have received the, um, the prompt to take the five question poll. So thank you also for doing that. Um, but yeah, great presentation, Sean. And um, thanks for working with me at Edge Impulse. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. Um, okay, so let's do the end slides. Again, we'd like to thank our TinyML Talk strategic partners. I won't list them all off again, um, but our executive strategic partners are ARM AI, um, Edge Impulse, the leading Edge ML platform, Qualcomm AI Research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous, Sentient end-to-end -end deep learning solutions for TinyML and Edge AI, our platinum strategic partners, Deep Light, Clica Tech, Reality AI, Renaissance, and our gold strategic our gold strategic partners, Photo Hub, Maxim Integrated, Latent AI, Micro AI, NXP, Seed Studios. SenseML, ST, SinSense, and our Silvit strategic partners, Aeon Devices, Enza, GreenWaves, Gravity Inc., HOTG, ImageMob, Itemis, Prophecy, Kikso, Reeksen, SAP, and Stream Analyze. Our next TinyML talk is directly after this one with Daniel Konigan and Marcus Rube, so stay tuned for that. And the PowerPoint and the recording will be available on the tinyml.org website after this. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>